And we are live, kind of, sort of, for your recorded podcast on Denmark and Marsh on this beautiful Tuesday, April 16th. We're officially, what are we? It's Tuesday, the draft's next Thursday, so we're eight days away from the draft being going on. I'm Dylan Denmark, that's Graham Marsh, setting up our video on the iPad, moving it oh so slightly. Yeah, it's not that good on me. The camera's not good on me. It's better on Graham whenever he gets over here. Um... We weren't able to do a pod last week because Graham has friends and he has to go to weddings. I was glad that we didn't have a pod because I was going to be tragically hurt to do a pod right after the death of O.J. Simpson. One of the greatest JUCO athletes to ever play. Played both ways, was a JUCO All-American, by the way. Um, I don't know if I would have done a pod right after that and been sane to do it. Um, I was just hurt the rest of the day on Thursday. Uh Juco athlete is what he's best known for. That's too. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, on Wikipedia, he's uh he uh played both ways because he, he didn't have the grades coming out of high school. I didn't know that was a thing back then. And then he goes to USC. I think Juco's kind of always been a thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then uh, the other thing he's best known for is uh, winning the Heisman. Yeah, I'd say the other thing three. he's best known for. Playing for the Bills. Yeah. It's probably one of the best Bills ever. Top, that, that's top about three. it in terms of noteworthy OJ things yeah, that happened that's what in I his would life, say. right? That's what I would say. Um, drove a cool car. Mm-hmm. A white Bronco. <laughs> the white Bronco went away and then OJ brought it back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, yeah, that was crazy, dude. When I saw that, I was like, what? Um, I didn't know he had cancer. Yeah, I, dude, I didn't either. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I was out of town um, starting Friday of last week. I uh, had a wedding to go to up in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, the rehearsal dinner was at this place called the Bridge Building, and it was right across the street from uh, a bridge. Yeah, well, yeah, the Cumberland Bridge, and then it was right across the street from like the skyline stuff, right next to like could walk to the Titan Stadium. The uh, so um, a middle finger or two may have come up from me, but you know it's fine. Did you wear your Jags gear while you were walking around, uh, or were you I, always in your? To the rehearsal tire. To the rehearsal dinner, no, because I, I actually didn't know that it was going to be there until I like GPS and went over there. Um, but the day of the wedding, uh, I wore uh, some Jaguar socks with my tux, so I had I had Pretty to sneak sick. it in somehow. Okay. You got to sneak in a little bit of Duval. There there was way too much Titans there, um, so I had to get a little bit of Duval action going. So yeah, you know. I hear you. That's pretty cool. So last Wednesday. Um, since we haven't reacted to it yet, it's kind of old news now. Josh Allen signs his extension, five years, $150 million. Um, I liked from both sides. I think Josh Allen got his fair share. I think the Jaguars get their fair share. Um, we obviously still don't know like whose side was wanting what, if there was if there was butting heads, if, if Jaguars trying to lower the deal, if Josh Allen's trying to get more money. I'm sure we'll find out, you know, who knows if it'll be, you know, next year or a couple of years down the road. Uh, but the deal is done. Um, and I think it's it's good for both sides. We can now move on from it. I thought that it was going to happen like it was at for Evan Ingram last year. I thought it would happen right before the deadline in July so in the I. summer. Um, and but credit to Mike DeRocca. We had him on the show on Jaguars today, and he was like, I think that this could get done before the draft. Yeah. And he came on. I was like, "Huh?" He's like, "Right." He's right, like, right I think right. it could happen, and sure enough, it did. Um, two weeks before, and uh, good, good on both. Yeah, um, it's really good for the Jaguars on a lot of fronts. The most obvious being that a really good football player stays in Jacksonville. That's obviously the the bare bones of it. There is a player that. Is very very good at his position. He's one of the best in his position, at one of the most important positions on the football field. He was a Jaguar, and he will remain a Jaguar. And this coming season, and for four years after that, as according to this deal, because it's a five-year deal, he will be making plays for the Jaguars. Hopefully, that entire time. So that's the number one reason. It's obviously positive. Is keeping good players on your football team is important. The other reason, and I know you guys have talked about this extensively on Jaguars today, so have a lot of the shows on 1010XL, and I I feel that it's necessary to echo this as well when you talk about the Josh Allen deal. This type of thing doesn't happen a lot for this franchise, man. Drafting a player early, first round, top 10 pick, pans out, plays really well. I know it's a debate because he had some years where he didn't quite get him sacks, so the disappearing acts and all that, but overall... Josh Allen has performed extremely well for the Jaguars since he has been drafted. 
particularly in his rookie year and this past year, which is his best season. So top 10 pick, which they've had a lot of, pans out, plays really well, wants to be in Jacksonville, voices that, I want to be here, I want to be a Jaguar, voices that multiple times throughout his five years here, and then gets a deal done with the organization to now you would expect that the vast, vast majority of Josh Allen's career will be here in Jacksonville. That doesn't happen for this franchise, man. It's a novel concept that other franchises that are successful seem to be able to do, but it doesn't happen here very much. Who was the last guy that the Jaguars drafted that they gave it a big extension to? I think it was Maurice like Bla- Jones-Drew. Uh, Blake Bortles was one. Well, I guess Blake, he, yeah. But... Yeah, kind of sort of. I mean, I'm just thinking of like last 10 years, like because it's not Jalen or Yannick or... Uh, Telvin Smith. Uh, I, I can't like I was literally thinking about that, and I couldn't think of one off the top of my head, off the top of my mind. I was like Blake Bortles, and that was like a three year deal. That wasn't a massive deal, and obviously they cut bait with him, and then they got Foles, and that didn't work. Other than that, I'm like, who have you signed big time contracts that you drafted in la- within the last ten years? I, I can't even think of like three, and yeah. I live in the city, you know, and. More recently and on a bigger scale, you've had you've had these things turn into a black eye more than uh, more than you have turned into success stories for the team, i.e. Jalen Ramsey being close to his his time for an extension a little bit early, but still close to it and wanting an extension because he had deserved it as a player and not being able to reach anything, talking down on Jacksonville, faking a back injury and forcing his way out of town and going and winning a ring and getting paid a lot of money somewhere else. And look, I understand Jalen Ramsey did. He was very unprofessional about the whole situation. He did a lot of things wrong. I'm not excusing him from everything that happened here whatsoever. However, that was a really bad look for the Jaguars when it happened. Just overall, just in terms of your few years removed from being arguably a bad call away from winning the AFC championship to your most talented player on your roster who should be up for a big money deal to to now play most of his career with you, forcing his way out of town and being pretty happy about it and being and, pretty glad he did that. And it's the one of the few guys in the last couple of years that got everybody knew nationally. Yes. I think that was another big thing. He was too. a star. Like, like, if you talked about the Jaguars anywhere – Outside of Jacksonville, you knew Jalen Ramsey, yes. and you knew he was one of the best players, and he had that personality, that was Correct. the personality of the corner, that trash talk. Everybody knew him. Correct. And then when he did that, it was like, ooh. Like, yeah. even if it wasn't on the franchise at all, it was all on Jalen, it still looked bad on the franchise when, when he did do what he did what he did. Correct. Um, so, and there's been more than that, obviously. The Blake Bortles, I know they paid Blake Bortles, but because of his because of his struggles and because of guys like Jalen and Unique and all these other guys, that was that was honestly a bad thing that they ended up paying him the money that they did. And there's been other guys, everybody knows that we, we could sit here and list it the rest of the podcast of dudes that they drafted that didn't end up being any good or the contract thing didn't work out. And it just typically seems like these things end up bad for the Jaguars, more than good. So this regime, I know people don't like Trent Baalke, and I get it, and I, he probably wouldn't be the GM if I had a say-so in it as well. But between Trent Baalke and Doug Peterson and sort of just what they've built the last two years, one very, very, very positive thing they've done is they have bucked a lot of negative trends for the Jaguars just as a franchise, that they've had problems that, they, that have plagued them for years over multiple regimes. This one finally seemed to end a lot of that stuff. Winning on the West Coast was one of those things. Um, making the playoffs, having a home playoff game was one of those things. Beating the Titans. Beating the Titans in Nashville was one of those things. Um, a lot of those things that, that has just been forever, and, and Jaguar fans, we didn't know if we'd ever get over these humps. They got over those humps. This was another one that they did. And I, and I, know, they did, I know their regime didn't draft Josh Allen, but the fact that they were able to keep a good player that – was highly invested in by this organization, have him perform on the field, and then pay him what he deserves and have him 
love this community, embrace this community like the old guys did back in the day. More of that, more of that, more of that. Good PR for the Jaguars. Generate, generate it to where every offseason this is a place free agents want to go. Generate to where every draft this is a place that guys would kind of hope they fall to and get drafted to. And I think that as frustrating as last year was and the end of last year, I think that stuff like this does overall just make the national perspective of the Jaguars better and more positive. So here's the real question. Fans always say, pay the guy, pay the guy from what he's done. Now we gave him a five-year deal. Yes, he's in the middle of his prime. How good does he do in this next contract? How good is he the next five years? Is he 16, 17 sacks? Is he seven that he's done the last couple of years? Or is he consistently right at 10, 11 for the next four or five because that, that is the question that you always have because we've seen plenty of times in the NFL a guy plays, eh, and then a contract year comes and he blows up. This didn't happen to Josh Allen, but you've seen it plenty of times in the National Football League. Contract year last year, he blows up. Okay, so what is he really? He had 17 and a half last year. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. I bet, I can't say the whole deal because a lot can happen in five years. Let's just say the next four, because that's really what he's getting paid yeah. for, guaranteed. Um, mm-hmm. I'll say on the field, production-wise, I'll say on the field the next three years, barring injury and stuff, we don't know. Well, let's say this, out of the five years, three years out of the five years of the contract, I bet he gets at least 17 sacks again. In one season? Yeah. Like three of the five seasons that he's under this contract, he will get 17 sacks. Man, I would go under just because you, I would, because you have Trayvon Walker, who you, you would expect to get better. You have Eric Armstead, who can rush the passer. He'll probably play 10, 12 games. That's probably, that's what he's done roughly the last two years. Played at least half the season. I'm hoping he can play more than half. And then you'd expect them to get somebody in the draft that can rush the passer within that time frame. I, I hear what you're saying that you're basically saying, are there enough sacks to go around Correct. For, for Josh to get that many? I, I get it. In my opinion, yes, because I believe that now we've now seen the two seasons Josh has been the most productive has been when that's been more of the case, when he's had more help on the D-line and He's had other guys to command attention from the offensive line and command game plan time and energy and that type of thing. Josh is the type of guy, I think, that when things are going well on the D-line, he makes them go spectacular. Does that make sense? He elevates everybody around him. Yes, and... And his game goes up with it. Yes, and he capitalizes on the fact that other guys are playing well. Right, and he becomes like the main X factor that just can't be stopped. Versus the times we've seen him struggle have been when it's been the opposite. When other guys are not creating any penetration, he also struggles, and I think that's because he's the main focal point of the offensive line, and they're sending chips his way, and they're they're putting running backs on his side to block, and tight ends his side to block, and the whole week for that defensive coordinator, I'm sure... For the defense coordinator, or sorry, the offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach, they're circling 41. And that's who they're talking about. That's who they're game planning against. His rookie season, teams were not able to do that because you had Calais Campbell to worry about. You had Unique Ngakwe to worry about. You had good linebackers to worry about in terms of the front seven. This past season, Trayvon Walker started becoming a problem on that other side. That He, he became another force that teams had to worry about. They can't dedicate all their time and energy to Josh Allen. Career season. In my opinion, and this might be a glass half full way to look at it, and you know, I'm a Jaguar fan, I root for them, I want them to win, so this is, this is going to be how people see it. In my opinion, that's why he had such a great season this past year, not just because it was a contract year. Josh is not the type of guy, in my opinion, to be like, all right, it's time to get paid, let's ball, then gets paid and slacks off. He's not that type of dude to me. I, I've, he's never struck me as that. Because even when he wasn't performing, I don't think it was ever an effort thing. I think it was just that the Jaguars' defense was easy to game plan against back then. You stop 41, you stop the pass rush. 
Um, so I think now you had Eric Armstead, who I don't want to say is going to be Calais, but will hopefully have a Calais sort of effect just in terms of that that presence, that penetration from the inside. And you look at it and say Trayvon should be even better, and he took a huge step last season. I just think that they're going to be they're going to become that line. I'm very optimistic about that line. I think they're going to become kind of a, a rebirthed Saxonville. And I think there will be enough sacks to go around because they're going to get a lot of sacks every game. I think this is going to be a D-line that's going to be getting, you know, you're going to look up a lot of weeks and they're going to have four sacks, five sacks, six sacks, especially against weaker offensive lines. I think they're going to really pounce. So uh, yesterday the Jags announced that they're going to go with the throwback logo finally. Yes, sir. Um, so yes, you're, sir. You're excited. You're ecstatic. Out of a scale of 1 to 10, you're probably on a million. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big so time. so what, what's the combo? What's the combo you want? Home uh, game, what's the combo you want? Okay, so we're, we're assuming it'll be a home game. Obviously. Yeah, I would assume. It'd be really sick if they did one home, one away. Uh, that might be too much to ask. I don't think they're going to do that. Because honestly, my favorite throwback jerseys are the white ones. I love the white. The white ones with the teal yeah. numbers are sick. The old pictures of them, uh, like up in Denver and stuff, player. It might have been the Bills. They wore white. I've seen those highlights, but someone that watched those live might remember. But the old highlight stuff of of Brunel, Jimmy, Fred, Keenan, like all those guys with the the black helmet. The black helmet with the old with the old yeah, Jaguar yeah, the head 90s logo. logo. Yeah, yeah. The white jersey. Teal numbers, teal numbers. I'm sick of the black numbers, man. Teal numbers, teal numbers, gold trim, full body Jaguar, uh, swiping Jag on the sleeve, white pants, black socks. One of the greatest uniforms ever made in the NFL. And then at, at home, because it's more realistic what they're going to wear because it's going to be in Jacksonville, same black helmet. Basically everything I just said, but teal jersey. Teal jersey, white numbers. Okay, so, so you like the teal over the black jersey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I doubt they'll do. I doubt the. I mean, maybe they'll do a black. I I thought it was really cool back in the Del Rio era when they did the all blacks for the night games. Mm-hmm. So if they have like a Monday night or a Sunday night, and they rock the the retro all black, you will not hear complaints from me. Trust me, because those uniforms are also amazing. But if it's a day game. And they're rocking the retros. I want the classic. I'm staring right at right at the Fred Taylor poster right here with him wearing exactly what I'm talking about. Black lid, teal jersey, white pants, black socks. That is like authentic Jack. And those, those uniforms are so much better than what they have, right? Ugh, like, dude, they're, they're so, so good, man. Like, they're so good. It's so funny, like, you know, this is more of a generational question. I'm not as into jerseys. Like, I'll go, okay, I like this over this. I'm not one of those people that like don't care about, you know, I don't care what they, they can put peanut butter on it, whatever. Like, Dempsey's like, ah, eh, whatever. And then Hack's like, I don't care. They can put it on a clown suit. And, and see, I'm still watching. Just win the game. Like, see, eh. see, I love Hack to death. Those people suck. <laughs> Just a word of advice, everyone listening to this. Especially if you're above the age of like 40 because it's typically you guys that do this. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Just, listen, and Hack is, I think Hack's 39. 40. Or 40. But Hack is like 70 at heart. No, he's 75. By the way. <laughs> yeah. the way. The way he operates things. Right. right. I mean, OJ dies and he's like, yeah, the movie is such and such. He goes, I'm sure you'll see it on TV. I'm like, yeah, I watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, what are we doing, dude? But, but he doesn't get it. Right. Just a word of advice, if you have already said that out loud or in your head while we've just been talking about the uniforms just now, don't be that guy, man. Don't be that guy. Look, your your stance and Dempsey's stance of like, eh, I don't really care, it's fine. That's fine. That's a fine stance to have. Like, I I don't get annoyed by you guys at all because you're just like, whatever, just like wear, wear the uniforms, try to make them look nice, but like, just play ball. I'm a little above them, but... Being, I understand what you're saying. Being, but being like kind of indifferent, that doesn't bother me. The people that are very outspoken of, who cares? Just play well. Just win the game. You've never won a game because of uniforms. Blah, blah, blah. Stop being get off my lawn guy. Uniforms are cool, man. Sports are entertainment. It is fun. It is fun to watch your team and have cool looking uniforms. It just is. I'm sorry. It doesn't mean that they're going to play better because they have them on. It doesn't uh, mean. To some. 
I mean, look good, feel good, play good for sure. But it, no, it, but I'm saying like the, the the like you know the people that are like the uniform combo. They're like, oh, we wore this back in '99, and <laughs> yeah, that's true. why we lost. Like, like true, right. I was talking about what happened about the Gators when they did. Oh, I'll forget what combo it was. It was like the orange top, blue bottoms, or vice versa. And they played this game against Florida State, and they lost. I'm like, that's really why they lost, like the combo, right? You know, like against or uh, when Jim McElwain was Florida's coach, that that was the era where they really mix and matched a lot of stuff. Yes, like, that, was, like, that was almost like every game they had a different combo. And look, I'm a huge uniforms guy. That stuff I don't like. I don't like getting too weird and off the beaten path. When Dan Mullen came in for Florida, I know I know we're talking about Jags, not the Gators, but when Dan Mullen came in. To, came in and he kind of reestablished we're going to be a lot more traditional once or twice a year we'll have some fun do some do an alternate do a throwback whatever for the most part though we're wearing what the gators wear i'm all for that i like that in terms of the throwbacks with the jaguars i don't think a single soul that has eyes and a brain thinks that the current unis are better than these retros everybody's talking about with the swiping jag and every not I mean we've all seen it online if you're online at all you've seen people that are not Jags fans have talked about how sweet these old school unis were dude they were awesome they were like one of the best uniforms in the entire NFL so one day I hope they go back to it full time or at least a modern version of that full time but for now like look again don't be that guy. Just everyone that likes the old school retro, just let them let us have fun and enjoy it. What what, what what's wrong with that? Is it going to hurt you? Or are you going to be a worse person? Well, they're going to be outspoken, like, and, and you know they're going to get off your lawn, and they're going to yell at the clouds whenever they wear it on that one Sunday like, afternoon dude, or Sunday night. J- like, look, the pe- when people that that say this type of stuff, I think the the those kind of arguments are kind of a. They have an opinion just to have an opinion. Like, I, For sure. I, I'm smarter than you. I know more, so I'm a yell louder than you. That, For sure. That's usually what those people are. And it's also a, it's also part of like a bigger conversation of like, it's sports, man. Like, don't take it too seriously. Like, it's okay. Sports are entertainment, man. It's not life or death. This is. If you're listening to this podcast, your favorite team is probably the Jacksonville Jaguars. You are probably at least old enough to remember games being played in these uniforms. Enjoy it. Just have fun. It's okay. Go to the game and watch it in person or watch it on TV and have fun. Just just think it's cool. Embrace it and root on your team. It ain't that hard. It ain't that hard. I, th- these people, there's a hot button for me. These people, oh, I piss, see. these people piss me off, dude. Like, just, just let sports fans enjoy things that aren't just wins and losses. It's all right. It, big soapbox. Sorry, right, soapbox over. All right, let's move on. Wait, wait, wait. On, we, that, on we, that point, we got more. We got more to discuss here. Okay, so we're not done yet. No, God, no. <laughs> I, dude, I, I talk about the, I talk about this the rest of the podcast. So we assume it's just going to be like the old uniform, and that's what they're going to wear, right? That's what most assume. Yeah, we don't we don't have any info, by the way. Like we, all we know is they put out the old school logo, the swiping jag, and that's it. Like we, we don't know what color, what game. All they've spe- all they've specifically said is the swiping jag is involved somehow. Um, and then I assume because the Jaguars uniform tracker thing was what tweeted about it, talking about uniform. So you assume it's going to mean the whole the whole ensemble. If I had to guess, it's going to be a home game. It'll be. I feel like when teams do their throwbacks, they typically don't do like division games and no. stuff. They do like an NFC game, stuff like that. Um, like this past year, they didn't do anything with uniforms, but they had like the like the Jaguars homecoming thing. It was the San Fran game. Like it's a, it's a non conference type of deal. So like, I think like the Vikings come to town. It might be like a Green game. Bay. That yeah, that feels like old school. Like yeah, the Green like, Bay uniform because the Minnesota they revamped their uniforms. Green Bay. It's still old school. Yeah. Jacksonville with their old school if they do it. There's also this like uniform thing with coaches where they don't like doing that type of different stuff when it's like division rivals and that it, it's it's kind of a it's just kind of a weird thing like that. Anyways, um I believe that'll be the ensemble. Black lid, teal jersey, white pants, black socks. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd agree I'd agree with the teal top. I, I think they're gonna go teal top. That's what I care about most. Would you rather 
okay, so okay, so you might have just answered my questions about to ask you. Would you rather them with these retros do a Sunday kit we just talked about or do a night game all black? If you had to pick it's close, but I go teal. I would too. Like when I just think of the Jags from the nineties and I see how good those guys were, I think of the teal uniform. I don't think of the black uniform. I agree. If and I only I get one game... Brought, I don't think they brought the black one until like the mid-2000s, like when they went all black. That was, yeah, that was later on, for yeah. sure. That was more Del Rio era. Right. Um, if I only get one game, that's what I want. I want teal. If I only get if I get a one-time use and that's it, I need, I need teal. If I got two, then the Jaguars are going to be getting a lot of my money. Well, and I think, you know, also, too, this this factors in, like, you, you can sell probably more of those teal jerseys. 100%. Than, than you would the black. 100%. I would, I would say. So. Um, one of the most important little pieces of the uniform that need to be there, and I'm sure they will be because I'm sure they'll pretty much just copy the whole thing. I need, because it's going to be white numbers if it's on a teal jersey, I need gold trim on the numbers. That, like... That helped back in the day. That helped bring the uni home so much. And it added, it was like a very small, subtle thing. Wasn't too much. It's not tacky, but it's just a nice little accent that just makes it makes a jersey pop so much. And I've I've remained steadfast that if the Jaguars are not willing to go back to some type of uniform like this and they want to keep whenever they change the uniforms again, they want to stay to something similar to what they have, at least give me that. Because their they're, they're uniforms right now are just too plain, man. Like, there's just nothing going on with them. Give me something. I don't need I don't need organs, highlighter, crazy. I don't need... And that's the thing. Like, you have to do it... It has to be a special occasion. Like, like you do it one time, and it's like a big moment. If you do it a couple of times throughout the year, it's like, it doesn't make it the moment as big. It gets watered down. I agree. Yeah. Which was back to, like, the McIlwain thing. They did stuff that the Gators don't normally wear, and it, they did things too often with the uniforms. Mullen, I thought, and even Napier, honestly, is, has done it pretty well, too. I thought Mullen nailed it when he was the coach. in turn, Because the coach really kind of drives it, at least in college. He has to say so for everything. The yeah. coach does in college more. I, the NFL, I think there's there's merchandising sales and all. That's a little bit different. But um, I thought they... The way they did it with Mullen was perfect. It's like once a year for like a homecoming or like a big game that's not a typical rival like the Auburn game, we're wearing retros. And the retros were beautiful. They were so awesome. Jags, once a year, like we said, let's against maybe an NFC opponent or something, or even a, even an AFC. Dude, you know what? I don't think they play them, but the Steelers would be perfect for those yeah. uniforms. Yeah. Just because the old rivalry and, and that type of thing, you're kind of revisiting the AFC Central. Like, that would be sick. I don't think they play him, though. But nonetheless, I'd, or they, who finished second in the uh, NFC North? You mean the AFC North? AFC North, sorry. Uh, Baltimore Ravens, won. Ravens were one. Did, Bra- I think Browns finished second. Yeah, they did. Yeah, okay, they so, were the five seed. Okay, so I think, I think that means the Browns, the Browns will come to Jacksonville, I believe. Is that a thing? I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that one's not quite the same. Steelers would be sick. But anyway, I digress. That's enough uniform talk, but I am very excited. Uh, let's move on to the last topic we're going to talk about, uh, the orange and blue game. We haven't talked to any spring ball from the Gators. Uh, I didn't really take away much. I watched the first half and I watched the third quarter. I will say this. Quarterbacks looked apart. And if you have yeah. two good quarterbacks, DJ looked apart. It's one thing to look good in practice on air for most of the time, and they can't touch you, and they couldn't touch them in the spring game. It's another thing to do it in front of, what was it, like 48,000 people that were announced, so it's probably 40,000-ish. When still the lights attendance. Were, when the lights were on, you know, everybody's watching you, and you still perform. That is something. I will say, you know, not a lot of excitement. There's not a lot of pizzazz and, and going into this season. But if you have two good quarterbacks, that accounts for something. It does. I think there's a, a subset of people out there nationally and fans of other uh, teams and that type of thing that are, because it's no secret at this point that Florida has a murderer's row schedule. But there's a subset of people that are saying, oh, they're going to win two games. They're going to win three games. Piggybacking on what you're saying, their quarterbacks are too good for them to lose, for them to only win two, three games. They won't be that bad. Um, now, We've talked about this at length on this podcast before. Their schedule is so hard, particularly the back half. 
that it's hard to see them winning more than like six, but they'll at least be they'll at least be somewhat they'll they'll be at or around five hundred simply because Mertz is a very good player. Lagway could be a phenom. And there's enough other good good guys. I mean, obviously you got Eugene Wilson, hopefully Andy Jean, Aiden Mizell make a big step this year and they play a lot. And then you've got uh, even with Trevor Etienne transferring, you still got a really nice stable of backs. Jaden Ball, oh my God. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. What? Talk about Mr. Coming out of nowhere. What the hell? <laughs> when did they get Barry Sanders in the backfield? He looks insane. <laughs> or Barry Sanders is not a good cop. He's... But anyway, um, almost like Damian Pierce. Like, remember that game yeah, one yeah, against yeah, FAU? Yeah. You're like, was it, was it FAU? I think it might have been. Or it might have been uh, the year before. And you're like, who is this guy? Yeah, and then you're like, we need to start feeding him. Yep, that might be him. Uh, but yeah, um, I definitely think Napier and um, Austin Armstrong probably had a uh, they probably had a pre Orange and Blue game meeting where Napier said, "Dude, you better not blitz my ass every goddamn play like you did last year." Remember, remember the Orange and Blue game last year? Like yeah. every play, this dude said in eight people in yeah. a spring du- double A gap. You're like, dog. Like last year, uh, Hayes, Hayes Carline, Frank Frangie, Lauren Brooks, they were all there in the press box, and I was with them because I was uh, engineering their show. And so we watched the whole game from the box, and Hayes and I were sitting there like, dude, like this guy's trying to kill our QBs, man. So I think they, I think they might have had a meeting before and a neighbor saying, don't do that, bro. Yeah, like maybe blitz like once or twice. Because, I mean, spring is usually just vanilla stuff. You run your schemes. You run your formations. You're not running – exact blitzes or reverses you're just getting your plain vanilla in and then you know you get your spring whatever it is your 15 20 prices and then you go okay how do what do we add from here once we go in the summer the fall the coaches don't care about the spring game in terms of like you know they, they always say the bs like oh it's an opportunity to get better blah, blah blah the coaches care about the practices leading up to it that's what they care about and seeing how guys develop and who might who might gain some ground or lose some ground and on the depth chart heading into fall, that type of thing. The reason that the spring games have always been a thing to put on TV and for people to come watch is just because fans are starving for football by this point. Yeah, and you have, like, college is so limited with practice and the info they give out. And you just need something. Um, I wanted to piggyback off the spring topic real quick, if that's if you don't mind. All right. Um, and I didn't want to tell I like not telling you this stuff and just throwing it at you to get, right. to get your yeah, raw yeah, reaction. Too, yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard on the Frangie show, I believe it was yesterday, Frank and Hayes were talking. They were kind of recapping spring game a little bit. and um, It might have been the last week. I don't remember what day it was. But Frank was saying something about, in terms of in terms of these spring games, you have the inter-squad scrimmage and all that. He was saying, like, do you think we'll ever see a day where... Yes, where we've you know where another going. team. That was what I was going to bring up next. Okay, Um because it has been talked about before. Like it this has. isn't something new. Like maybe Florida plays Miami or something for a spring game or, or that type of thing. Two questions here. And you already answered one of them, which is do you see a world where this will happen? You say yes, I think yes as well. In my opinion though, what I'd almost rather see and I think coaches probably would too. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but just something that I think I'd rather see is instead of having like a spring actual game where you play an opponent, I'd rather still have it the way it is now, and it's just an inter- and it's just inter squad. But then, when the season comes around, because nowadays with the expanded playoff and the conference realignment and stuff, there's less and less and less cupcake games than there's ever been. I think it'd be cool if college football had like maybe like a week a week long or maybe two week long like preseason where when the the spring game talk is much more realistic it might actually happen this is just me making up stuff but back in the day something back in the day just a couple of years ago and then dating back to forever you know how it goes you used to always play your cupcakes first two to three weeks of the, of the year and because college football doesn't have a preseason, that was basically your preseason. Is Florida would play FAU or USF or whoever, and they 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 have some fine tuning and kind of get through stuff and let their their new guys get some experience under the lights before they had to go play Tennessee. It was normal. Tennessee was kind of the kind of the real kickoff of Florida season. 
um, or Kentucky. And now that that's not a thing anymore, now that basically every school that's worth something is playing a big a big time game week one, they're playing a big kickoff classic game. And now with the conferences being the way they are, man, you're playing ball. You're playing real games basically from from that point forward till the rest of the season. Florida's got the hardest schedule, but everybody's schedule has gotten harder with with how. And that's a good thing that we've talked about. We want the best teams to be playing each other throughout the year. What about starting the season or starting preseason early to mid August? And Florida has some like two of those cupcakes, and 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 you pay them, you get a paycheck game, so those smaller schools can still get the money they've always relied on. What do you think about that proposal and for me? No. You're not into it? No, I mean, the NFL is... I don't know when this will happen. They're going to eliminate preseason eventually. I, I think what will happen with the NFL is... I mean, college football is basically adapting everything the NFL has done so far. The NFL is going to add another game here soon. I say probably within the next three years. So they're, they're, then they're going to be down two preseason games. Yeah. And then they're only going to play on one... And then it won't be long after that where they're going to be like, yeah, we don't need this anymore. I think. Okay. Uh, so once like once that happens, and the NFL goes, yeah, we don't need preseason. And when they've done preseason all these years before, why does college now need to do it? I understand what you're trying to say. I think they would just. I think that still coaches in college are such control freaks. I don't know if they would want to do something like that two weeks before their week one game. Just because the risk of injury and everything like that. And I think for somebody to bring it up and want to do it, it would have to be two really young coaches that are innovative that just want to try something new. Like it's not gonna be an established Kirby Smart or Ryan Day. Like it's gonna have to be two young guys like up in their thirties that are like thirty seven years old that want to do it, I think. See, I disagree with you there. I agree with you that that you know, why would college football do like why would they feel the need for it? Like from a from a monetary standpoint and from the TV contracts and that type of thing, I agree with you. It's not something they really need to do or would want to do. Um but I'll, I disagree with you with the coaches because I think what's something we hear coaches talk about all the time, especially in college. Competition. Competition and reps. And you can get reps in practice, obviously, but in but game feel reps are so hard to come by, and for a long time you've had this like informal preseason in college football, basically, where you play the cupcakes, and it gives it gives your fresh your true freshman a time to play, and because you because you're going to be up forty points, it gives them time to play in the second half and get those reps and go through drives and do some cl- and your quarterback your your second and third string quarterback can do some clock management things and and all that stuff. And with the way the season is now, your depth pieces are getting no reps like that anymore, especially now with the expanded playoff and with the SEC and Big Ten collecting all the big teams. So I I disagree with you about coaches. I think they'd like it because it's a chance to get their guys more reps in. That said, the spring game would serve the same purpose. I think it'd be more better served like what they do in the NFL with the practice like, like the team, joint practices? Yeah, like I feel that's more beneficial because you can get more situational stuff. You can get more goal line. You can get more red zone. You can do a two-minute drill. It's more controlled. You can do one-on-ones, and it still serves the benefit, like the, you know, getting work in with, your, you know, your tackles and your DNs and your receivers and the corners. I think that's better. Um, you know, the only question is, you know, who – because it always goes back to money. Like how do how do you build this to where – like, do we put this on TV? Oh God! Do we, yeah. you know, do we put it in a stadium so people can watch? Do we? You think they we, would do this and not televise it? Oh, I know they will. But you think saying, ESPN's like, like how, nah, just play the game? It's we're more good. of because you know you're you're going to have the SEC network, the ACC network, the Big Ten network, and now the Longhorn network's going to probably be with the SEC more than likely. Um, that's something that I would rather see something more controlled uh, rather than. Just you know your, what the SEC is seeing? Money. They're, they're looking at a bidding war for these games, dude. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're looking at all the networks you just said and said, "All right, highest bidder, let's go." That'd be sick. Now, now, question though: If they did something like that, would would the opponent 
be a cupcake or would it be like I'd rather be good. I mean, I, I'd rather I, be like too yeah. quality. I obviously would too. I obviously would rather have that. But I'm saying, what do you think would be more likely? For a sp- do you think it'd be more likely that Florida goes through spring practice playing fam you? Yeah, uh, when when the orange and blue game traditionally has been, and they're leading up to it, maybe some joint practice, or whatever, and they play fam you or they play Miami. I don't see a team like FAMU just because you can't sell to your guys like this is an opportunity to get better. When you're 85 guys, I mean, FAMU might have less than 10 guys that are good enough to play for Florida. Yeah. By and large. I'd rather it be good on good, and I think that's what that was what the coaches would rather want. I, I think I agree. And I think you if you have a little bit of pride on the line... Because it won't, the game won't count for anything, obviously. But if you have a little bit of pride on the line, in terms of like, okay, this is a team we don't like. This is a team we want to beat. This is a team that we can make a statement against. I think as a coach, you're looking at that as an opportunity to get your guys to practice a lot harder all the spring. And a lot of days where guys would probably be kind of going through the motion, especially especially the dudes that because guys that are fighting for a spot, they're busting their ass because they want to play. But especially the guys that have, um, that have it like a surefire role, like you know they're, they're for sure starters. Let like Jason Marshall, okay, Jason Marshall's gonna be a starting corner for the Gators. Everybody knows that. Like if they're playing, you know USF in this spring game, that does does he care? He's like, nah, let's go through the motions. And let's that's get another thing. Gun. Like, let's dude, not get hurt. Football pride just sucks, dude. Like it sucks. Like, we talk about this a ago. It it's, sucks. You're high, you're in these pads. You're a lot of it's just the same thing over and over again. Like you know you gotta do it. You do it. It's just like buh. and when and, you get to like week three on a Wednesday, Thursday, you're trying to get the week over. You're you're waiting for the weekend to get here so you can have that day of recovery or two. Like it gives you that extra juice knowing that, okay, I'm playing a dude that's probably going to be a first-round pick, probably going to be playing in the NFL and be drafted in the first three rounds. Like, that's, that that's gives a good, you an extra juice. That's a good point that I didn't even think about, but you're right. Like, This is one more opportunity to improve your draft stock. You're good on good. Like, like you're, If you're a – you're a, like, okay, uh, Eugene Wilson would be a perfect example. I am sure Eugene Wilson, after next year – because that next year will be his, his third year removed from high school, he's going to be an NFL draft prospect, and he's going to be wanting to have as good a tape as possible and as high of, as high a stock as possible. Someone like him, who's obviously going to start for Florida, typically spring ball for him will be all right. Let's let's go through the motions, let's get some chemistry going on, let's stay healthy, but but not let's not go crazy. Now, if I got Miami week one, and they Miami's just been the easy example because I know they're going to play like Florida State. They're not going to play a, a big rival like that. If I got Miami, you know, to cap off spring ball, or I don't know who else. Who else is a good example? Georgia Tech or something. Someone that's not that far away, I'm sure, is who, they, who they'd play. I'm, they might keep it in the SEC. But anyway, and they've got a, a corner that's coming out this year, and right now he's got a first-round grade. That's another opportunity for me to say, I'm going to ball on his ass. I mean, remember Stingley, the DB from LSU, we come out of the draft. All we heard was, look at what he was when he was a freshman, and he had a coverage of Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. And look what he did. And all they showed was practice film. Yes. Like, they didn't even show, like, That's a great the point. game yeah. film of everything that he did when he was locking dudes up in the SEC. They were like, look at this film. Now, look at Jamar Chase and Jefferson, Jefferson in the NFL. Look at him in practice. I don't know. I like to see it. It gives us more content to talk about. But so okay, say they do play like they do play a, an opponent of consequence. Who would that opponent be? Do they keep it all within conference? I do think, they keep it regional? What, what? How do you think that would work? It'd probably start in conference because you can control it more. So like Greg Sankey and everybody, all the head coaches can get on a conference call and they could you and know, they can just govern it all set it up and then they could put it on TV however they like. But I would guess that's how it would start and then it, it would evolve to something a lot bigger. And you can't play because you can't do it against a big rival. No, Florida can't do Florida spring game can't be capped with Georgia or Florida State or something. Like, I know Florida State's different conference, but or Tennessee it can't be a big rival. It's got to be 
Florida, if it's if it's in conference, it's got to be you know Florida's ending their spring game with Mississippi State. Yeah, and I don't think the location matters. I mean, the college football playoff alone is getting a billion dollars by itself, right? Uh, and that's not not even going along with with the conference, um, like what they're getting paid and all that. I mean, it wouldn't shock me if Florida plays Oregon or USC or Michigan or. Uh, a Virginia, Virginia Tech. Like who? I don't think. I don't think that the travel matters. But I think it would start in conference if I had to guess, and then it it gets something bigger. Uh, I just saw you checking your phone. Uh, Coach and Joe are not coming in by the okay. way, so we don't Ten have to four. be out by one. Um, yeah, I'm curious to. I'm curious with this because I agree that that it'd be cool, and I also do agree that I do think at some point it is going to happen sooner than later. I mean, if if you're sitting here listening to it now saying that's crazy, they'll never do that, you probably said the same thing about a 12-team playoff five years I ago. I mean, five years ago, you wouldn't expect college football to be what it is right now. Hell no. Like, you, you wouldn't have said five years ago, Texas is going to be the SEC. I mean, a, a lot crazier things have happened in the last few years of college football than this. By the way, the transfer portal is open today. That's big. I... Uh, there's a lot of people that are in it. I don't know who the big guys are. Um, so you're probably going to see a lot of good teams. Probably some guy like you're basically to me, this is more of the guys that play on good teams that know they're not that they're not going to start because they've went entire spring. Most of them like I know there's a couple of games this Saturday and they're like, all right, I see a writing on the wall. I'm gonna get in the portal, I'm gonna see where I can go. Those kind of guys are going to be the portal. Um, give me one position on offense and one position on defense you'd like to see the Gators get a nice portal addition from in this cycle. O line. Where specifically? Guard, guard, and then on the D D line, I don't care where. Probably, I I go interior. Both trenches. Yeah. So kind of kind of Jags vibes. Yeah, let's get some. I, I, let's football, get some beef in the middle. That's just football in general, man. You can't. You can never have enough depth. And I think both on the lines. And I think both teams that are the main topics of conversation in this podcast that we do, both teams can use help in those areas. So I, I, I agree with you there. Um, Cameron Jackson did get hurt. I'm trying to remember. It's because he didn't come on the podcast. Yeah, I'm trying to see. I didn't get an update. Well, I guess he was walking around after the game, so it was fine. Uh, but he did go down with an injury. Uh, I guess he's fine. But uh, yeah, I just you can never have enough guys because I mean a perfect D line is having you have four. You mo- by and large you have four guys, and then you'd like to have three to four nice rotational guys. So you could go every four or five plays and just rotate, and they stay fresh the entire time. Like that is what you want in a perfect world. Yeah. That like that's what you had in Georgia when they won when they went back to back. I think like Trayvon Walker played him and Jalen Carter and all those guys. Like I don't think any of those guys played over sixty percent of their snaps. Yeah, because they didn't have to. Yeah, when you stay fresh and you got dogs everywhere, no pun intended. Like you just don't have to, and that's what I would want if I had to pick. Okay, so you, so you want depth in both trenches? Yeah. Um, I would like on the de- on defense. I agree. Another another nice guy in the middle that can get that. Yeah, can just add depth to the whole room, and then hopefully rush the passer a bit from the inside. Um, that type of guy, I agree. I'll zag a little bit on offense. On offense, I think I'd like a this. This isn't realistic, but an experienced receiver, I would like. Like again, getting so, getting someone this good won't happen in this cycle because this cycle, like you said, it's later. It's guys that are not seeing a lot of playing time in their current spot in spring ball. Whatever. At the power five level, yeah. But like, like an experience, like if they could kind of fill a Ricky Pearsall void with some, like just just. And again, I'm not saying you're gonna get. You're going to get Ricky Pearsall in terms of a talent because he was. I mean, they struck total gold with him for the last two years. I just mean in terms of a receiver that's been around, has played some college ball, 
has caught a lot of passes and knows what they're doing, can be dependable. I guess they kind of got that with uh, Shimre DK, I think is how you say his name, mm-hmm. from Wisconsin. I guess they kind of got it with him. I, I actually forgot about him when I made this point. But even with just one more guy that's just played a little bit of ball, because outside of him, you've got basically one year's worth of experience for Eugene Wilson, who was very good last year. But if you recall, if you kind of go through and look at his highlights and stuff, it was mostly short stuff. It was mostly slants, jet sweeps, more creative ways to get him the ball, almost gadget ways. And you imagine this year he'll do much more downfield route running. But even for him, that that type of game in the college level is still new, and you're hoping Andy G and Aiden Mizell take a big step and they play a lot. Man, they're brand new to it to playing college football. They didn't play really at all last year. So just someone else that's caught more passes in college, I would I would like on the offensive. You end. could look at a group of five guy, a guy that's played two three years. Um, Which that that type of perfect. Yeah, went to Tulane. So I know a guy. So there's a guy I went to Baldwin. He went to Jacksonville State, earned a scholarship, played two years there. He balled out last year. He just entered the portal last week. He's outside linebacker. I mean, I don't know what he's trying to do. I haven't talked to him, but a guy like a guy like him that like plays Tulane, receiver, right? Louisiana Lafayette, uh, and I mean, it's not, I mean, <laughs> look at the class couple of guys. You had uh, Osiris Torrance came from came yeah. from a group of five. You've had uh, Montreal Johnson, who's obviously good enough to part. So it's not like, and also, a lot of these guys coming out of high school had to settle for a group of five because so much now the power five, they don't look for high school. They look at the transfer portal. So a lot of yeah. those guys, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle. It doesn't mean so, they can't play. Right. So there's still plenty of, Plenty of talent in that group of five. They just weren't. They just weren't enough numbers for them to get that scholarship coming out of high school. Agreed. Um, so I that's just something think, to look out for. Yeah, I think. Or even if it was a tight end, I like Arliss, but I'd like to. I think it'd be cool to have another one that's again been in college a while. I just think on offense in terms of pass catchers, I think that room could use a little more age and experience than they currently have. So that, that's what I'd like to see. Defense, I totally agree with you. Interior D line is what I'd love to see. All right, anything else before we roll out of here? Before I had to practice, uh, one more quick topic. It will we'll be will be brief about this one, but this is the most important thing we talked about all day. Okay. Um, OJ so, Simpson. Yeah. So, like I said, I was at a wedding this weekend. Um, three straight nights of open bars. Okay, they had a welcome party Thursday night, rehearsal dinner Friday night, wedding reception Saturday night. So there's free drinks all weekend, right? Unlimited White Claws. Yeah. Had a fantastic time. Drank a ton of alcohol. I feel like a butt's coming. But right now I'm exhausted. <laughs> so my question is, <coughs> we are mid-20s. We're both 26. You're 26, right? Yes. Okay, we're both 26. For you at this stage of your life, again, we're not We're not saying we're, we're not old, we're not but like we're we're past like the college, like let's get hammered every night. Yeah, we're not eighteen anymore. We're in between that. We're in between. I never want to go out, and I always want to go out. Right. So by by day four, like Sunday, waking up after three nights of drinking, I was like, I don't want to think about alcohol, and I never got crazy hammered or anything. But just like just a lot of drinking, you know, throughout the weekend. So my question is for you: What's the number of days in a row? going out, drinking, doing stuff, where by this day you're like, this is it. Like, I'm done. I need I need a break. I'd say three. I'm not a heavy drinker. I, after after three, I'm like, all right, I've, I've had enough. Like, if I had, like, if I had, like, your plan, like, four days, I'd go drink a little day one. If I had to, like, go heavy, go hard day, I'd go day two, and then I'd recover the other two. Day three, you're just surviving? Just yeah. Yeah. I'm not a dr- beer drinker. I drink, you know, like a vodka Sprite or yeah, they had all that rum and Coke. I, that's my kind of, if I do that's, drink. That's the one thing, man, that was good about it, is it was, it was like, high-end stuff the whole time we were there. Like, I'm talking good. Drone. Yeah, and, like, it, it was, it wasn't drinks that give you wicked hangovers the next day. Yeah. So, like, it was, it was high-quality stuff. We were drinking day but the day three though, day one and two I had I had some like cocktails and stuff, but day three I was all beer just because I was drinking like basically all day, starting at like I think one to like three in the morning. And I knew, 
you know, first like hour or so, we're like on this bus driving to take pictures. I was in the wedding and we just had like a cooler with beers in it and we didn't have any, any other options to drink. So I started drinking beer then and I got like three or four in and I knew the only thing that was really going to hurt me the next day was either get obviously getting too drunk or mixing at that point was going to hurt me. If I drank all day and had seven different drinks, that was going to, that was not going to be good for me. I was like, all right, I know I'm, I know that I'm going to be consuming alcohol the rest of the day. I need to stay consistent. So I just went beer, beer, beer. And but I kept it, kept good pace, mixed in waters. I was good. Low cal beer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was about day three too. It, it was a ton of fun because like it was a lot of good friends, people I haven't seen in a while. So I had a, I had a great time. But if there was any type of reason I had to go out and drink more on day four, I'd have been like, I ain't doing that. No, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I'm I'm sitting on the couch and sleeping. Yeah, I mean, now that I think about, it, I couldn't tell you the last time I went out, even like to the beach bars, like a regular weekend. It's just not it ain't in my repertoire anymore, man. I still like going out, but a regular weekend when there's not like this weekend, obviously it's a wedding. There's a specific event we're celebrating, a specific a reason to do stuff. A regular weekend now when there's nothing in particular going on, you you can get me out once. If I went out on like Friday though, I'm I ain't going out Saturday or vice versa. Like if I know I'm going out Saturday, I'm not going to go out Friday. Like now I used to every Friday Saturday, but now it's like I'm going to pick one. Yeah, and it's money too. It's like that's dude, you'll you'll rack up a time. Now th- this time I got I got to drink free for three days. So that was great. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's awesome. So all right, we're done. At least I'm done. Almost an hour. Denmark and Mars get on any podcast platform and on Facebook Live and on YouTube. Uh, That's it for me, Dylan, Denmark, and Graham Marsh. We'll see y'all later in the week. Yes, sir. Peace.